Colossians tonight. If you'd uh, like to turn your, in your Bibles to the book of Colossians, and we're in chapter number four, and we'll read together from verse two down to verse six. Colossians chapter four, reading from verse two down to verse six. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Our Father, we pray you bless us as we look into the a scripture tonight, help us Lord to understand and apply these truths to our lives, we pray. So we commit ourselves in this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In these verses that we've just read, we see um, the tongue is being used in three different ways. And we looked at it, we began looking at this uh, last week, and we saw that uh, our tongue is used in our, in our prayers, our tongue is used in our uh, public speaking and it's used in our uh, preaching and last week we, we concentrated on the subject of prayer and and then specifically that the prayer would be that we would uh, be able to have a boldness and a consistency uh, in our preaching um, and we did consider that the tongue is indeed a very um, powerful member of our bodies James chapter 3 is very instructive as to how we are to use this particular member and in fact our all of our communication needs to be done under the control of God's Spirit whether it's uh, when, when we speak or whether it's through uh, writing a, a letter or a, on social media it all always needs to be under the control of uh, God's Holy Spirit but we, we continue tonight looking at the subject of our tongue again um, but as we look at verse 5 and 6, we see that it's we have two main subjects, if you like, um, that we, we consider in these two verses. And it has to do with our walk and it has to do with our words. And so that's what we'll look at tonight. So he says in verse 5, walk in wisdom uh, towards them that are without, redeeming the time. And then in verse 6, it comes back to the, the communication side of things. Your tongue, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So this has to do with what we say and what we do. And so what we say and what we do is obviously going to re reveal a great deal about us. And there, as Christians, there needs to be a harmony in our, our walk, in the way that we live our lives, and in the way that we speak. I'm sure you've heard it uh, said before that somebody says, uh, to a person that's misbehaving that what you do shout so loud that I can't hear what you say. So we need to make sure that what we do is in line with what we say. So in other words, we would say you don't want to just walk the walk, but we need to talk the talk. We don't want to just talk the talk, but we need to walk the walk as well. So the first thing I'd like you to consider is the matter of our walk, the believer's walk. <laughs> So in verse 5, he says, walk in wisdom towards them that are without. So the word walk here, it has to do with our conduct. It has to do with the way that we're living our lives. And then the word without there has, is a biblical way of referring to people that don't know Christ as Savior. And in fact, when you think about just that word without, it's very instructive as to a person's condition outside of Christ. Because you could say, well, a person that is without, they're without the family of God, or outside of the family of God. A person that was, is without, they could say they're without salvation, they're without Christ, they're without hope. So it's quite descriptive. And so Paul is saying that as you and I live our lives, we need to walk in wisdom towards them that are without, those that are unsaved. And uh, so we need to make sure that the way that we we live our lives is going to be a testimony to a lost and dying world. 
And, and when we do so, we also need to be mindful of the fact that we were once there. So I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once a person that was out on the outside. I was without, but now I'm, I'm thankful that I've been saved. I'm sure you can say the same thing uh, tonight, that you're part of the family of God and that you're able to uh, say, well, I have Christ, I have salvation, I have hope. That's a blessed thing. Uh, I was speaking actually to Sam just the other day. He sends his regards. Uh, he's up in Newcastle now. Uh, but he was asking me a question about somebody who had a, um, uh, it was like a Jesus only type of doctrine. And so this guy was obviously quite uh, confused and was trying to confuse Sam. But Sam realized that this was wrong. But when, in speaking to him, I just thought to myself, I'm so thankful that um, from the time when I was saved, the out of my Christian life, I've always been in a church that preached the gospel. I was never in a church that, you know, was, I was never in a charismatic church. I was never in a church that had false doctrine. It was always a, a good Bible foundation that I had. And so I never really had to go through a process of undoing uh, bad teaching, if you like. And I'm thankful for that. There was a time when I was without, but now I'm able to say, praise God, I'm within. I have God, I have salvation, and, and uh, I'm part of the family of God. But, of course, we shouldn't think to ourselves, well, we're the elite now. We're within and they're without. And so, you know, we don't want to strut around like a bunch of peacocks. You know, sometimes Baptists can be like peacocks. You know, we kind of strut out those feathers. Look at me. Look how important I am. Look how good I am. But the fact is, we're just sinners saved by grace. And so we need to walk in wisdom towards those people that are without. So I'd like you to notice that... Uh, with regard to our walk, he says, walk in wisdom. And so we need to walk wisely. That's what Paul is saying. And we need to walk wisely because the fact of the matter is, is that those that are on the outside are often looking at the way that we live our lives. They're evaluating us. In fact, we could say quite clearly, they're actually judging us. And oftentimes an unbeliever has within his mind, whether rightly or wrongly, but he has within her own mind, his or her mind, that there's a particular way in which a believer should live. And so if you were to do something um, out of character, for instance, they perhaps they've observed you for a while and they know your, your witness and they know your lifestyle and you do something, say you started drinking or smoking or doing something and then you, they'd say, but I thought you were a Christian. They say, well, this is unusual that you've got this kind of behavior because in their own minds, they think that a Christian ought not to do that. So the fact is, is we need to walk wisely because there are the people that are without. They're looking at us and they're judging us. Now, of course, you might say, well, it's an unfair thing. They are holding you and I to a higher standard than what they hold themselves to. But it doesn't matter. They are judging us. And so let's walk wisely and so it's no wonder that jesus said in matthew chapter 10 and verse 16 he said behold i send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves and then he said be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves so we need to walk wisely in this world and then in ephesians chapter 5 in fact in fact ephesians 5 is like the complementary passage to what we've just read but in verse 15 to 17 it says See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So what Paul is saying is essentially is that the way that we walk, the way that we live our lives, we shouldn't do anything that is going to jeopardize our testimony. He says walk in wisdom. And so when we have dealings with and this is the context is particularly to do with those that are without those that are lost in all of our dealings with them we need to make sure that we are beyond reproach it should be that the unsaved person should be thankful that they're going to do business with you as a christian it should never be a matter of watch out for that christian they don't pay their bills watch out for that christian because they're going to try and deal underhandedly with you that would be a terrible testimony. So as Christians, we need to make sure 
that uh, we live our lives in such a way where we're going to be paying our bills, where we're going to keep our promises, where we're going to be diligent in all of our dealings. And so the unsaved person, and this has got nothing to do with their salvation, but just as they observe you, they're able to say that person is at least living an honorable life. They're living circumspectly. They're living in a good way. And that's how we, that's what we should endeavor to do. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 12, uh, Paul says the same thing. He says, we must walk honestly towards them that are without. So when, when a Christian has a bad testimony, so, you know, whether, you know, it could be anything. It could be, you know, the way that he speaks to people, the way that he treats people, the, the underhanded things that he or she may do. But when, whenever they de- live in such a way where they're a, a bad testimony, it doesn't just cause the unbeliever to look upon that Christian and tuck tuck and say, well, that Christian shouldn't be living like that, or that church is a bunch of hypocrites. They're not just thinking bad about you and I. They're thinking bad about our Savior. And so we bring reproach upon the name of Christ if we don't walk aright. So Paul says, walk wisely towards those that are without. Because the fact of the matter is, is that although the, the lost person has no discernment when it comes to the matter of the things of God, they, they're in darkness, they do not understand the, the teachings of the, the Word of God, but they do tend to have a lot of discernment when it comes to the things of this world. And so as you conduct yourself within this world, even in your secular dealings, walk wisely because they're looking, they're evaluating, and they're judging. Paul says walk wisely, walk in wisdom. Don't do anything that's going to cause a person to think or say something bad about you or about your church and, more importantly, about your Savior. He says walk in wisdom. Don't do anything that's going to make it difficult for a person to hear the gospel. Because the fact of the matter is, when uh, an unsaved person comes into contact with a believer that is kind of rebellious, that plants a seed within them where they say, well, I know a Christian that does or is, and then they've got this war. And so we shouldn't want to give them any kind of ammunition in that way. So he says, walk wisely. And then the second thing he says is we need to redeem the time. Now, this word redeem, uh, redeeming the time, literally means to buy back the, or buy up the opportunities. In in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So he's saying that, you know, essentially we are running out of time. So we need to not just walk wisely, but we need to use our time wisely. And this matter of redeeming the time is kind of like a commercial usage of the word. It's like... If you went to the shops and you saw a bargain, you you would want to seize that opportunity to take the bargain because you realize that tomorrow that bargain may be off the shelf. So you'd seize the opportunity, redeem that opportunity. And so in, in particular tonight, what we need to look at is not only are we to walk wisely, but we're to redeem the time. And the best way of redeeming the time is reaching out to the lost because the days are evil. We don't know when our Lord is going to come back, and so we need to give them the gospel, give them the gospel, be a witness, because we don't know when our time is going to be up. So redeeming the time has the idea of looking for opportunities to uh, share the gospel message, seize those opportunities that come our way. You think about time, you know, you, you've heard the saying that people say, well, time is money, but you know, You can always earn more money, but you can never regain lost time. And so we need to use our time wisely because the days are evil. It's a non-renewable resource and we need to seize the opportunity and in particular seize the opportunity to talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think about Paul, when he wrote, uh, he wrote much of the New Testament, but most of his letters are prison epistles. So he's writing while he's in prison. But he didn't mope around in prison saying, oh, woe is me, I'm in prison, I'm in chains, and I'm cold, or I'm hungry, or I'm, you know, I'm suffering from my wounds. 
he redeemed the time. He wrote letters. He he explained the Bible to Christians. He evangelized the lost. He prayed for churches. He he was doing what he could. He just redeemed the time. And so it's a good uh, example for you and I to follow. So the, the, the first thing that we see tonight that is so important is we need to walk wisely and we need to redeem the time. That's a, a good thing for you and I to, to seek to do. And so tomorrow we'll be blessed with a new day. We need to walk wisely in that day and we need to use our time for God's glory. And then the second thing we, we see in verse 6 has to do with our words. So he moves on from the way that we're walking now to the words that we will use. And in verse 6 he says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. The believer's words. Now Paul urges us to add three things to our conversations. You know, sometimes you maybe in a group of people and you think, well, what shall I speak about? Somebody comes to me, what shall I have a conversation about? And so Paul gives us three things that we really need to be adding to our um, to the things that we're going to talk about. I'm speaking to mostly ladies tonight, so I know you, you've always got <laughs> subjects and you'll kind of move from subject to subject easily within the conversation. But as you do that, these are three things you can add. And it's grace, it's salt, and the third is to have an answer. These are three things that Paul says you need to add to your, your speech. Grace, salt, and an answer. And again, we, the reason why we need to add these things is because of those that are without. Those that are lost. We're going to speak to them. We'll be in their company. We'll have opportunities to witness. So we need to use it. So it's not going to be enough. For us just to pray for the lost. And it's not going to be enough just to live our lives right amongst the lost. We have to talk to the lost about the Lord. That's the, that's the way that people are going to hear the gospel. So we saw last week that the tongue is a powerful member. And one of the most powerful ways in which we can use the tongue is telling people about the Savior. Telling people about the gospel. So... Paul says, have grace, have salt, and have an answer. These are three very good spiritual things that we need to incorporate into our day-to-day -day conversations. We, we've learned a lot as we've kind of grown up, haven't we? We've, our conversation has been steered by our parents. We've taught, been taught how to do things. So we, we've been taught how to greet people. We're taught how to say please and thank you. These are things that we need to embrace still and, and be uh, you know, polite in our conversations. We need to be kind and we need to be considerate. But these are three things that are just so important. So if you like, if you want a recipe for a good conversation, here are three things. The first is, he says, add grace. He says, let your speech be always with grace. So he's saying we need to be graceful in the way that we talk. So if we're going to be graceful, then that's going to rule out harshness. It's going to rule out gossip. It's going to rule out criticisms and unkind, ungracious talk. Paul says, let your speech be always with grace. Now we might think to ourselves, well, this, is, this can be quite a challenge because sometimes we're placed in challenges and situations. But the secret to have your speech always be seasoned with grace is to have grace in your hearts first. If, if there's grace within your hearts, then it's going to be naturally on your tongue. Look, if you would, back at chapter 3 and verse 16 of Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Thanks. see, here's the thing. If... We want to have grace on our lips, then we need to have grace on our hearts first. Otherwise, it's just going to be, we'll soon be caught out. And so we need to make sure that we are allowing God's word to dwell in us and we're being controlled by God's Holy Spirit. Grace on our hearts will mean grace on our lips. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 
number 34, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, what's in your heart is going to come out in your speech. What's in the well will come out in the bucket. And so what's in your heart is going to come out in the way you talk. And so if your heart is seasoned with grace, then that grace is going to be on your lips as well. And then notice that he says uh, that this grace on our lips, it needs to be always. So not just some of the time, not just on a Sunday, not just in a, in a Christian meeting, but all of the time. All of the time we need to have grace in our dealings with other people. And we all can say that we're guilty of the fact where we are, uh, say, angry words or where we say unkind words or maybe we've said something too quickly and we just kind of wish I could have our words back again. But, you know, once you've said it, it's gone. You can never retrieve those words. So by God's grace, we need to look to Him to work so in our hearts that our lips will always be seasoned with grace. And we need to follow the example of our Saviour. You know, in everything that our Lord did, there was always the matter of His lips being, you know, just seasoned with grace. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 22, the, the Bible says that all... The people, they wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. They just marveled. In another place, the Bible says, they said, never a man spake like this man. He, he was absolutely gracious in the way that he dealt. And, and let us be mindful of the fact that he was gracious in speaking to a people that were stiff-necked and hard-hearted and the people that embraced sin. He was gracious. Now, there were times when he used some stern <coughs> words, but always his words were gracious words. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, the Bible says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So if we want to minister grace to somebody, then we need to have grace in our hearts and on our lips first. So, God's ideal for our conversation is, firstly, is that we need to have grace in our speech. Allow God to work in our hearts and lives. Allow God to work so that that which is on our heart is going to come out and be on our lips. And then the second thing he tells us to add, in the second part of verse number 6, he says you need to add salt. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. So he says, you're, in your conversation, you, you need to add some salt. Now, salt does a number of different things. In fact, it does three things that we can say where we can see the benefit of salt. The first thing about salt is that it enhances flavor. Now, have you ever eaten something where somebody hasn't put in salt? This is terrible. You remember Amy and Alex? Amy was a, uh, she had trained to be a doctor. Her father had uh, heart problems. The, the doctor said to him, you need to cut down on the salt. Well, we went to Amy and Alex shortly after they were married and we had a meal with them. There was no salt in the house. Nothing. There was no salt whatsoever in the food. Well, I could have died. I thought, I said to Tracy, next time I visit, I'm going to take a little bit of salt <laughs> with me. Because the, it was just, I know you, you, you probably get used to it, but salt has a, has a way of drawing out the flavor from, from the food. But in this particular instance, it's not talking about food, but it's talking about our speech. And you and I, we need to be a salt. And we need to be as like a good flavor in the conversation. We need to uh, be a people that when we have a conversation, that we are going to add some flavor. So you would say a good conversationalist would be someone who is well read. And this should be true of all of us. But you know what's really good is if we are well read in the Bible. The wonderful thing about our Saviour is that in his conversations, he always brought out so much Old Testament truth. And so if we're going to be as salt and enhancing the flavour of a conversation, it's going to be as we talk about scriptural things, as we talk about our Saviour, as we encourage people in the things of God. And so salt is going to enhance flavor we need to do that in our conversation and then another thing that salt does is it stops corruption 
So you add salt on things to preserve. Now we all know that oftentimes we're in conversations where people have filthy mouths and the topic is filthy and it's just, you know, the conversation is just, uh, is just wicked. Well, our, our witness and our disapproval of sin and of wickedness should have a penetrating effect where it's going to stop the corruption. It should be that as believers that people are going to kind of, you know, clean up their, their language when they're around you and I. And in fact, the same way that you and I are kind of sensitive to their bad language, I think oftentimes a person who swears a lot is sensitive to the fact that you don't swear. And you should speak in such a way where it's going to be uh, preserving. We live in a society where it's so decayed by sin and our words should stop the corruption. And again in Ephesians chapter 5, in verses 11 to 13, we like to turn there. Ephesians 5, 11 to 13. He says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So you and I, in our conversations, we really should have a part to play in kind of cleaning up the conversation and, to some degree, the lives that people are living. To the preacher, this is the command that is given to him. In, one, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. And doctrine. So you can see that the, the Bible is saying quite specifically that we need to be, uh, in our speech, we need to be a, uh, you know, a preserving, stopping the corruption. Uh, in, in Titus, Paul told uh, uh, Titus to rebuke the people in Crete. He said, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. So he's saying there are words that you've got to use, and you've got to help stop the corruption. They might have to use some stern words, and you and I at times might say some words, but always it needs to be with grace. So in other words, we are going to speak in such a way where you might rebuke the sinner for what they're doing, show your disapproval of the sin, but your love for the sinner, so that you can bring that person uh, to the Saviour. So we need to, again, we need wisdom in order to do this. But Ephesians chapter 4 says that we need to speak the truth in love. Not just a matter of blasting people, both barrels going. We need to be talking to them, speaking to them the truth. But our motivation must be love. And so we need to say the right thing at the right time and in the right way. We need to be this kind of influence for good in other people's lives but it's always a sad thing if a christian is speaking in a rude or a coarse uh, manner particularly when it's amongst the unsaved because that's going to be a bad testimony so we need to see that we as as um, as we speak we need to stop the corruption we're going to add to the flavor and then the third thing about this um the way that we talk and the aspect of salt is that it creates thirst. You know, the more the more salt you you put into something, the more likely you're going to want to have a drink. And our talk, our speech, ought to be such that not just are we a flavouring a conversation, and not only are we, you know, preserving and stopping corruption, but we're giving people a thirst. I like what happened with. The woman at the well in John chapter 4. When Jesus spoke to that woman, and she, you know, she was lost in sin, but Jesus spoke to her in such a wonderful way where it created within her a thirst, where she would say, Sir, give me to drink of this water so that I never thirst again. And so we need to use our words in such a way where it's going to create within another person a thirst to come to the Saviour. You know, you've heard it said that you can lead a, a horse to water, 
but you can't make a drink. And that's quite true. But you can give the water, you can give the horse some salt. And it won't be long before the, the horse is going to be wanting to, to drink. And so we need to be using our speech, let it be seasoned with salt. And then when you think about this matter of salt, we find that the Bible doesn't just say that we are to be our speech seasoned with salt. But it also tells us, remember in the, the Beatitudes in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, ye are the salt of the earth. So we need to recognize it's not just our speech, but we ourselves are to be a flavoring, a preserving uh, influence and an influence in people's lives to bring them to the Savior. So Paul says, add grace to your speech, add salt to your speech. And then the third thing is you need to add an answer to your speech. So he, he uses this phrase, he says in verse 6, uh, uh, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And then lastly, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So we need to recognize that in our talking with people, that we need to be at a place ourselves where we're able to give an answer to them. Because if we're using our speech correctly, and we're kind of bringing a person to a point where they're in a hunger and thirst for something that we have, then you've got to have an answer. It can't be a matter of, well, you know, I just I believe what, what the church believes, or I believe what the, the Bible says, but I can't really take you to anywhere in the Bible. We really need to get to the place where we know the Bible. And when people come to you, you've kind of given them a thirst, and they've got some questions that they want to ask you. They, they, they need some direction in their life. Who's going to show it? Well, you're the one that's going to show them because you've got the Word of God. Peter said it like this. He said, be ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. So you need to be able to point people to the Savior. You need to have a good working knowledge of the Bible so that when you talk to people, you're able to bring them to the Savior. So... We recognize that our speech needs to have an answer as well. And so that encourages us because, of course, the Bible is a big book. There's so much to learn, but it encourages us to be a good student of the Bible. And kind of, you know, there are certain questions that are often asked and get a working knowledge of it so that you can speak to people and be able to give them an answer. And more specifically, the greatest question that will ever be asked and the question that you must be able to answer is when a person comes to you and at the end of their tether and they say, what must I do to be saved? And your answer needs to be such where you can take them through the plan of salvation so that they can come to, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see our walk and our words. People are watching our walk. They're looking as to how we live. And so Paul says, Walk wisely, redeem the time. And then people are going to be listening to what we have to say. And so again, Paul says what you need to do is you need to add some things to your conversation. You need to be adding grace and salt, and you need to have an answer. So may the Lord encourage us tonight that we would live right and that we would be able to give the kind of uh, verbal testimony that people need to hear about our Saviour. May the Lord bless you. Amen.